All right, welcome everyone to the National Crime Victim Law Institute's RISE, Rights in Action program. We are starting a new series that will come to you once a month on the third Wednesday of that month. And this one is about how a lawyer can make a difference. So these are going to be live sessions with our RISE clinics, our partners across the country who are fighting for victims to ensure that they have a voice in the justice system. So I'm your host, Jennifer Storm. I am a consultant with NCBLI. And again, we're going to be here once a month on uh, the third Wednesday of each month at 3 p.m. Pacific time, again, with our legal partners talking about elevating, enforcing, and activating victims' rights. So the National Crime Victim Law Institute fields thousands of technical assistance requests annually. And we encourage you, if you have a challenge, if you have an issue and you need expertise, you need guidance, you need assistance, to please reach out to NCVLI and request technical assistance because the amazing staff there can help you. They can address your concern. They can get you the resources that you're needed. So this month, we're excited that we have Elizabeth Well, who's the legal director for the Ohio Crime Victim Justice Center with us. So good morning. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you are, right? Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, well, welcome to our series. And just thank you so much for the incredible work that you're doing on behalf of crime victims. I know Ohio's clinic has been you know, top notch and you guys have done some innovative, incredible precedent and setting work. Um, so tell us a little bit about the types of legal representation that your clinic provides and why is it important? Yeah, so under the RISE grant, um, our clinic has really focused on our litigation in both the trial courts and the appellate courts of Ohio. We represent all victims of crime. So whether it's a sexual assault, domestic violence, theft, right? The whole spectrum. We represent all of those victims. There's no obviously monetary limitations. There's no you know paying us, we're pro bono, like all of the RISE clinics. And we make sure that those core constitutional rights that are contained in our Marcy's Law, as well as the myriad rights in our revised code and our court rules and our case law are all protected throughout Ohio's courts. And we litigate, like I said, from the trial court level all the way up to the Ohio Supreme Court. And we actually have a case that we filed in the United States Supreme Court. So we're crossing our fingers that they accept it. That's awesome. And thank you. And again, this is predominantly work done in the criminal setting, which we don't often hear about or think about enough when we're talking about really making sure victims' voices are heard. Yes. Very exciting. So you mentioned the courts, and I know you want to talk with us a little bit about something that's happening in Ohio, specifically within your Supreme Court and a case that you guys are working on. Yes, so we actually had a case of first impression that I just argued on the 27th of April, so it's very fresh, the trauma is very fresh, in the Ohio Supreme Court, and I want to give a shout out too to my co-counsel Michaela Deming with Ohio Domestic Violence Network, we worked on this case together from the very beginning. And essentially what we had in this case, and by the way, I have permission to share the facts of this case from our client who really wants folks to be aware of this case. Um, a victim of domestic violence, uh, there go my dogs, of course, apologies. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. <laughs> so we had a victim of domestic violence who uh, had, had the offender had been convicted, right? He went all the way to trial, even though the offense was on video, took it to trial, unbelievable. And as a result, as y'all may or may not know, when you're convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence in this country, there's a federal law that says you lose your firearms rights. So you are federally firearms disqualified. Well, this particular offender, former police officer, wanted to get into private security, which is terrifying. And he filed an application in our state courts asking for relief from his federal disability. So Michaela called me uh, because the client had originally reached out to her and she said, hey, is there anything that we can do for this client under Marcy's law? And we had these rights under Marcy's law to safety and reasonable protection from the offender. And we said, like we were talking and I said, you know, maybe we can try to invoke those rights in the appellate court and see if we can get some review of what the trial court has done because we don't think the trial court should be able to relieve a federal firearms disability. So definitely a unique case for Ohio, uh, first of its kind. We filed that in the 12th District Court of Appeals and we actually won in the 12th District Court of Appeals. They issued an opinion that said, 
a state trial court cannot relieve a federal firearms disability, specifically that the court lacked jurisdiction to do so. So we were ecstatic and we also knew that we'd be going to the Ohio Supreme Court because the offender wasn't going to let that go. And so ultimately we ended up there and we briefed the case, argued the case. Um, in, in the argument, there was definitely an impression that the court wanted to side with us. So we're really, really hoping to get a decision for the entire state, for all the victims in the state, and hopefully for victims in other states too, since this issue really hasn't come up. Um, that could be precedential throughout the country that would disallow state trial courts from relieving federal disabilities. No, it's incredible and it could have just wonderful impacts. It's one of the reasons why we encourage these cases to be even brought up, right? Because the outcomes could have a ripple effect across the country. So to that extent, without an attorney, right? Without a clinic like yours, what would this victim been able to, what would she have been able to do? Like, like how, how do you perceive the outcome of this case if you wouldn't have been there with the resources to intervene? Yeah, in fairness, and, and I think victims can do a lot, to be fair, they can do a lot in trial courts in terms of asserting their rights. But I think once you get to the appellate level, because of all of the procedural hoops to jump through, it's next to impossible for a pro se victim or a victim even working with a very knowledgeable advocate to be able to accomplish a successful appellate outcome. So, I mean, the client has even said directly, I don't know what I would have done if you guys hadn't helped me. This would have never been brought to the attention of the courts. He would have just gotten his firearms and I would have been in danger and that would have been that. And so, you know, I think especially when we get to appellate litigation, it's just critical that victims have attorneys to help them. Just that guidance, that advice, it, it's, it's unmatched, right? You can't find it so easily on a website or in a book, for sure. Exactly, yes. So let's talk about NCBLI. Were they of assistance? And if so, how and what were they able to provide? Of tremendous assistance, yes. Um, so from the very beginning of this case to the end, you know, I think when I initially was like, maybe I'll invoke these rights, I reached out to the executive director, Meg Garvin, and I was like, what do you think about this? And she was like, yeah, do it. Um, so just you know, giving me the encouragement that I'm kind of on the right track. And when it came to briefing, NCVLI provided like in-depth comments, notes, edits to all of my briefing that really helped improve my arguments. Um, you know, coming up even with some ideas that we hadn't thought of that we incorporated in. So it was tremendously helpful. And I think I was on a Zoom call with Meg probably a week before or oral argument talking to her about my oral argument strategy. So like from beginning to end, NCVLI provided just a tremendous amount of support in this case. That's awesome. Yeah, it's mentoring that's just unmatched, right? <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't get that information anywhere else. Tremendous. Yeah. So in this specific case, you touched on this a little bit about your hopes for what this will mean, um, but what did you learn? If anything you know, with similar laws or similar issues where you would encourage others to kind of go the same route that you went or anything that you learned that would be good for others to know? Yeah, absolutely. If you're in a state, a jurisdiction like Ohio, um, where you have misdemeanor uh, offenders who don't lose any of their civil rights, as a result of domestic violence convictions, this would apply to you too. And the challenge to the trial court's jurisdiction is, is universal, right? The trial courts, no matter what state you're in, the, the United States Supreme Court has very clearly said, if you don't take away rights, you can't give rights back. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's applicable. And again, we're really hoping that we have a positive outcome in the Ohio Supreme Court that could be used by other states to stand for that proposition there too. It's pretty universal. Well, we're rooting for you. We'll be watching that case obviously very closely because it's so incredibly important. And thank you. Thank you for not only taking the case and asking the questions that sometimes people are afraid to ask, but also supporting that victim and that survivor in that way. Because not only now is her case going to have a positive resolution, but she may be able to walk away and say, I just impacted the lives of how many people because of these amazing attorneys, so. And she's aware of that. And I think that that's one of her favorite things about this whole process is just the impact that she could have, you know, not just for herself, but really for other people like her. 
it's so important. So kind of probably a no brainer, but would you recommend individuals out there, whether it's survivors, victims, advocates, system-based lawyers, would you recommend NCDLI and, and why? And, and, and should people reach out to NCDLI for tactical assistance? Yeah, absolutely. Since the beginning of my career doing this work, and it's been coming up on eight years now, um, I have been in contact with NCVLI, and I think that that contact has done, like, I, I can't even begin to describe, like, how much it has helped develop me as an attorney and as a victim's rights attorney specifically. There's just a wealth of knowledge concentrated there um, between NCVLI and, and the RISE clinics across the country that is information you just can't get anywhere else and support you just can't get anywhere else. And it's just been tremendously helpful. So I 100% recommend, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you're obviously doing incredible work in Ohio. Where can people find you? How do they get in touch with you? How does one be able to bring an issue forth to your clinic for consideration? Yes. Yeah, so we actually have a really, really easy intake process, just a form that's, you know, a handful of questions on our website, which is ocvjc.org. So if you just visit our website, click on the tab for victims, there's a lot of information there and also the ability to reach out to our entire team and seek our assistance with any victim's rights violation for any victim. Awesome. Well, again, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you for taking time out of your uh, lunch hour today to join me. Uh, for the rest of you, like I said, we're going to be here once a month. Uh, every month, we're going to bring you a case from a different clinic across the country talking about victims' rights. But until then, please contact ncvli.org. If you're seeking resources, information, we've got quick tools. You can quickly access technical assistance. NCVLI is constantly doing trainings. In fact, we have our annual conference that we're Hoping will be in person, but there will be a hybrid option in November in Portland, Oregon as well. So go to ncvli.org, get that information. And if you need help, we are here. So please reach out to us. Until next month, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Goodbye.